everyone to yeah welcome everyone to this uh, European American seminar series on collaboration in wind energy. We have a seminar every second Wednesday of the month, and this is the last in this season, and we'll start again in September, and we will already have some, uh, two good talks in September. So the whole purpose of this is to further collaboration between European researchers and American researchers in wind energy. And now uh, Sue will announce the, next, the, the speaker of today. Please, Sue. Okay, and today we're fortunate to have with us Dr. Xiaoli Wong. She's an atmospheric scientist in the Environmental Science Division at Argonne National Lab. She's been working at Argonne for 12 years and currently serves as Uber Principal Investigator of, of Trexo that we'll hear about today. She plays a crucial role as the Research Integrator and Physical Modeling Lead for the DOE-funded urban project titled Community Research on Climate and Urban Science. And moreover, she's also the hydroclimate modeling lead for the DOE-funded Great Lakes Modeling Project, which aims to understand the interactions between the atmosphere, land, and lakes. Okay, Jali, are you ready to share your screen? Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, it looks great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you everyone. And I'm I'm sorry to to uh take you actually 10 minutes for waiting this uh for out of my calendar, but let's get right. Uh, started uh, right away. Uh, so this project is funded by um, Office of uh, Wind Energy uh, Technologies. And uh, this is a project that uh, multinational labs and universities are collaborating. And um, so the focus here is the, uh, we're investigating the extreme weather in particularly the tropical and actual tropical storm impacts on the offshore wind energy. And we also, um, considered climate change impact. And the short name of this project is Trexel. And there is another uh, sister project that is going on led by Unreal, which called Storm, uh, which is also looking at the extreme weather impact. Um, but we are focused on different skills, different modeling uh, techniques. The ultimate goal is to provide a uh, better risk assessment uh, for um, uh, wind turbine design and eventually hopefully to guide uh, some revision or modification in the in the design standard. And um, here is our team and you can see that we have uh, collaborators, you might see many familiar faces and those are from Argonne National Laboratory, uh, from Unreal, uh, from PL and NCAR. And different labs have um, different contributions and focus on different tasks for this project. Um, and, um, uh, and we also have uh, connections between Trexel and Storm uh, so we can always work together and, and make this project uh, you know, more um, uh, practical to uh, engineering modeling and eventually put into the practice for, uh, for the uh, turbine design. Um, so so um, I also want to mention that for there are different tasks um, for the um, uh, so we have mesoscale modeling, we have microscale modeling, and microscale uh, coupled with mesoscale. Uh, there are also uh, risk assessment uh, tasks. There are also um, uh, AI machine learning based downscaling uh, to uh, efficiently uh, downscale any mesoscale simulations to the microscale. Um, and, and today, for today's talk, I'm going to focus on the mesoscale 
uh, which uh, Argon uh, has spent time on. And uh, I believe our team will also take this great opportunity to uh, present uh, other tasks, for example, the mesoskill to microskill coupling, uh, and also the AI machine learning uh, downscaling. Uh, for both, both those two tasks are are specifically for hurricanes, which is for the first time actually we are exploring this. Uh, there are challenges, but there are also very exciting results and and findings. And um, uh, I hope we can present to you. Um, uh, in the very near future. Uh, uh, so today we are going to focus a little bit more for the massive scale modeling, and uh, we can discuss more at the end uh, if you're interested for other tasks. So the uh, motivation of the massive scale modeling uh, here is that um, there are already idealized case simulations that you have already heard in our previous uh, webinar presented by uh, Professor Judy Longquist and also her, her whole team, right? So one of the example of this paper uh, led by um, uh, Miguel uh, Sanchez Gomez uh, using idealized hurricanes to study how the uh, wind uh, speed distribution, uh, the turbulence, uh, the shear and veer could be potentially potentially larger than the standard. So what they find is that there are um, the very high possibilities for different categories of hurricanes exceeding the, the, the design standard, which you can see from this figure. Um, and for different hurricanes representing by different colors, and those vertical lines are the uh, standard for um, uh, the uh, uh, turbine uh, for tropical, uh, which is the gray line, which is uh, uh, 55 meter per second for 10 minute average. And um, the motivation for us is that we know the uh, hurricane boundary layer is also sensitive to the interactions with the ocean uh, surface and physics parameterizations. And those are um, not available yet in the idealized simulation. And we like to consider it in the real hurricane simulations by considering the, the coupling or the communication exchange between the ocean and wave and atmosphere. Um, okay. Uh, this slide actually should appear earlier, but um, again, you can see that we uh, the whole project actually covers this uh, Earth scale and the mesoscale, scale, uh, which describe the uh, cyclones, the ocean and waves. Uh, there are of course also the clouds, uh, the rainfall. If you goes to uh, inland, which we don't really focus for this one, but you also have lots of rain or even freezing rain or snow, and also with uh, uh, considering the climate change impact. And, and all those data and the output of this simulation uh, would be uh, input to uh, micro scale modeling, this including uh, the engineering modeling or numerical modeling uh, at the wind farm and turbine level, and also uh, the AI-based downscaling. And both of those are aimed to achieve the scale that is uh, really a concern and, and an interest of, of the um, wind turbine design. And um, so here, so what we have been doing for the uh, massive scale or the um, weather scale coupling is that we have been uh, developing our uh, fully coupled uh, massive scale model, uh, which used the uh, WARF as the atmosphere model, the FACOM for the ocean, and the SWAN for the, the waves, surface waves. Uh, this can be easily also switched to Wave Watch 3, uh, depends on the needs. Uh, but we have been also uh, validating this model capability uh, against the very well uh, established uh, modeling tool uh, that is the cost that's already in the in the community for for decades and in uh, many research activity actually have been utilizing this modeling tool um so so here you can see that 
uh, we are enabling uh, uh, two-way communications or exchange. So you can see that for each two component, it's fully two-way coupling, online coupling with certain frequency. And you can um, change the frequency depends on the, uh, the needs. Uh, what we do here is we do hourly exchanging um, for the coupling. And um, uh, there are, of course, some, some very tedious uh, model development, especially for the uh, open boundary. Uh, when you go to the ocean, this is different from if you put this uh, uh, ocean model to a closed boundary lake or something. So it involves much more uh, development and more uh, solid knowledge about the the um, initial condition boundary development, uh, because you do need to consider the the, the more complex physics and in uh, bathymetry um, in the open ocean. And um, uh, the other thing that we want to mention is that um, by using the FVCOM uh, ocean modeling uh, tool, uh, we are able to do this regional refined. Uh, mesh, which is shown on the right, uh, that you can go to very high spatial resolution at any region of interest. Um, and the left is an example of regular grid. For example, uh, uh, the ocean model ROMs is using this, but right now you can also do actually nesting uh, in the ROMs, which you also allow you to, to go to very high resolution. Um, so by coupling this re regional refined model with the uh, surface wave model and the atmosphere model, uh, we will be able to achieve some high resolution simulations uh, over the region of interest, some, uh, such as some wind farms. And uh, we believe that this is a capability that is supported by the wind energy technology community that allows uh, all of us actually can use those modeling capability more uh, freely, um, knowing the, the physics and, and modeling code better and being able to uh, make changes more uh, easily than using other modeling tools. Um, so again, this is a demonstration. You can see that, uh, for example, this is our um, atmosphere model domain. And uh, this is the ocean domain and your ocean domain can do uh, refinement along the coast or near shore or any region. Um, and in that over that region, you can do uh, regional refine and that can provide um, some high resolution um, uh, output uh, for the wind farm or for the micro scale um, coupling or downscaling. And I will show you how actually the impact of those spatial resolution from both atmosphere and the ocean uh, impacting the results. So um, just to remind us, um, there will be, so we will present uh, three experiments in general, uh, although they're designed for different hurricanes or uh, using different parameterizations, but in general, we are presenting three of them, uh, which one is the atmosphere only, you will see the experiment A, uh, atmosphere ocean coupled modeling, you will see AO, and atmosphere ocean and wave coupling, which is, uh, we call it AOW. And for this AOW, there are three um, uh, wave related uh, processes that we uh, have been um, allowing the coupling. Uh, the first one is the surface roughness. Uh, this is impacting actually the, the waves impacting the uh, surface roughness and the drag coefficient, and this directly impacting the atmosphere model. Um, and the, the second one is the uh, wave induced radiation stress on currents. And this is a, a, a change in the ocean model. And the third one is the non-breaking wave induced vertical mix, mixing. Uh, this is also in the uh, ocean model. Uh, of course, there are uh, other, for example, the breaking wave is already available in, in, in uh, the current modeling tools, for example, cost. Uh, this non-breaking wave 
uh, which based on uh, previous study, it's very important, especially for uh, strong hurricanes uh, that can in, uh, induce um, uh, vertical mixing and reduce the uh, sea surface temperature and, and then can uh, reduce the, the hurricane intensity, actually. And this is so far based on uh, our investigation is not available yet in the latest version of COAST. And we um, implement actually in both COAST modeling and in our modeling. So we will be able to see this one. There are other studies, for example, um, incorporating the uh, wave breaking induced sea spray, uh, which uh, was demonstrated by previous study. There are also some impact of, of that. Um, there are also great studies that uh, from DTU um, uh, led by uh, Xiaoli Larson and, and, and Jian Tingdu, and they have been developing this um, uh, a wave atmosphere coupling uh, through the PBL, actually, which avoid all those parameterization um, as used in the current studies in, in both cost and in our model. And I have been reading their papers and also Jenting's PhD um, uh, thesis. And I found they're very useful actually to, to understand all those better uh, because there is a, um, uh, there is a flat uh, change after a certain point in the, uh, the surface roughness that not necessarily or uh, parameterization actually can achieve that, but that is uh, something observed um, based on on uh, laboratory experiment. So, uh, and in the 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 coupling that they are developing actually can can do a, a pretty reasonable job on that. So, uh, that's something that I I would like us to to aware of, to be aware of. Um, so, um. Uh, now we are talking about the uh, model validation of the um, uh, new coupled modeling uh, framework. And for those model validation, we have done quite a lot of testing uh, to help us understanding those. Uh, I would say uh, we are about one year and a half into the project, and we have spent um, quite a lot of time actually building the conversations with industry, academia, and national labs. We have um, uh, conducted uh, workshops, symposium uh, with the, uh, people from different um, uh, affiliations, different institutes. Uh, we have also done a literature review. At the same time, we have been doing this uh, model development and the validation. Uh, so the results are getting more and more, you know, we get more and more confident and, and um, more robust, but those are preliminary and we are open for any discussions or, or offline follow-up after this. Um, so in summary, what I'm going to show you uh, here are um, summary, uh, summary described here. Uh, so first thing is we validate the new model against the, the cost and, and see whether it can give reasonable results if you use exactly the same input uh, to this modeling, whether you get similar output. Uh, the other thing is we look at the, the impact of coupling effect on the wind shear and veer. Uh, this is basically kind of trying to do similar investigation as uh, Sanchez Gomez paper, paper um, but using the real hurricane simulations. Basically, if you consider all those coupling process, do you actually um, do you actually modify or or change the shear and veer? And that means you do want to consider some. Uh, more considerations or changes in the design standard. The third one is evaluating the, the model performance ag uh, against the uh, drop sound and, and, and reader data, which the reader is on an airplane, which can give you 3D vertical profiles uh, and the horizontal, of course. And uh, we also developed this uh, regional refined mesh um, and test the impact of the spatial resolution of the ocean model, uh, test the spatial resolution of the atmosphere model. And uh, because this is a regional 
modeling capability, and you always need to decide a model a uh, domain size, and you also uh uh right so so that domain size uh can be important or not. That's something that we also want to investigate. So we can um decide a domain size that can do a reasonable job, but then you don't have to uh take too much computational resource. That's the that's the goal. And uh, the other thing is when you do this regional modeling framework, uh, regional modeling, you do need forcing data along the boundaries um, every certain hours, three or six hours, and what data you can use and what, what data available, what's the performance of all those data. Um, this was actually one of the topic actually at, at the um, uh, IEA WEN meeting uh, that I uh, pit, uh, participated to and meet uh, some of you uh, here, uh, but uh, in person uh, in Denmark, that was very fun. Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, the so first thing is we validated our model um, uh, against the cost, right? And we uh, uh, for this uh, validation, we use a nine kilometer and we only have 42 vertical layers. Remember, this was the uh, initial stage. We're not tackling any wind related, uh, wind energy related problems yet, but just want to see whether the model is, is working properly. And you can see that when we, we simulate one of those hurricanes, Hurricane Florence in 2018, which was a uh, category uh, four at some point, um, and it cost, uh, I think, five five hundred year uh, flooding events uh, over um, uh, some locations over the North Carolina. And for this simulations, we conducted uh, exactly the same experiments, um, but using different modeling tools. And you can see that this on the left, this is the uh, wind speed of, of coast. And uh, the other is the ocean currents of coast. And this is a one day average. Uh, so you can see that there is a line that's the uh, movement of the uh, hurricane center. And you can also see the very strong uh, Gulf uh, streams. And in our um, uh, coupled the modeling, uh, which we used the Wharf Ficom and, and Swan, uh, we were able to capture this um, uh, large wind speed uh, along the hurricane traje trajectory and also the um, uh, Gulf Stream. And this actually, it, it seems um, pretty simple, but this actually did involve lots of uh, you know, testings and development to make sure this really uh, looks uh, reasonable and, and performs um, decently well so you, we can move forward. Um, this is the uh, wave height uh, still for the same hurricanes and you can see the uh, spatial pattern of the wave height. Uh, it was uh, based on our model results, it's reached about uh, 50 feet high uh, at certain time point. Um, but I think in real case, um, there are some camera uh, taking results and, and see there are some uh, 80 feet high waves for, for this event. So it is pretty strong. Um, we also uh, compare using, okay, so once we establish the um, a validation of this model and showing it is reasonable comparing with uh, other modeling tools. And we start uh, looking at uh, the differences between atmosphere only, the atmosphere ocean coupling, and the atmosphere wave ocean coupling. Uh, we have done lots of experiments to understand each of those components, each of the wave processes uh, coupling to this this um, experiment. And here, uh, to, to be simple, we just show three experiments. And you can see that in general, the um, tracks are getting better compared with the um, atmosphere only uh, simulations, but there are still some shift 
uh, for the tracks, especially after it made landfall. Uh, but I want to mention that this track actually is um, heavily impacted by your forcing data, but also by uh, parameterizations in the atmosphere uh, model. And this was something that we haven't tested over uh, for, for this hurricane for this purpose yet. Uh, but the track uh, can be improved um, uh, by changing different physics parameterizations. But if you look at the intensity, which shows on the right, the top is the uh, minimum sea level pressure uh, for different time during the hurricane lifetime. The bottom is the maximum wind speed. Um, uh, from both, you can see that the uh, coupled results um, is uh, improving uh, on top of the, the atmosphere only. Uh, this improvement include it actually um, make the peak or the face uh, closer to the observations. Uh, but also the uh, because that phase shift actually the the intensity is also improved uh, before and after the peak. So here we also uh, look at the uh, differences of between those three different experiment and um, how the uh, wind speed distributions and uh, the wind shear. Uh, and veer, which is shown in next slides, how they are different when you uh, run just atmosphere only or atmosphere ocean and, and wave coupling. And you can see that in this case, the uh, atmosphere wave ocean coupling actually shows a uh, shorter and narrow distribution, um, and uh, which is uh, very different from the atmosphere only or the atmosphere ocean coupling. And in this case, case actually, we see some reduction of the wind speed, uh, very likely due to the, the, the wave increased surface roughness and the non-breaking wave uh, mixing, vertical mixing. Um, you can also see that the wind shear show on the right is also very different. Uh, especially uh, at the right tail. Um, so, and we have this um, uh, reference line, vertical line from the design standard. Um, so we have, um, we couldn't, um, we didn't know the uh, real observations, right? Uh, real situations because we don't have observations, uh, but at least this demonstrate the, the differences. Um, although I think there are, uh, many things that we can improvement, and that's something that we are working on right now. Uh, that is the simulation that we're uh, showing here was very pre preliminary, and again, it was it only have a few um, layers at different heights, which is uh, not necessarily enough actually for looking at the the uh, the hurricane boundary layer, um, and also the spatial resolution can give you a huge impact uh, of the results and then the high resolution actually can improve this a lot. So uh, we are actually redo those analysis uh, using our uh, very most recent results, which um, I'll, I'll show you uh, later. Um, and this is the uh, veer, basically the direction change at different heights. And you can see that when you coupled uh, ocean wave processes, your uh, wind veer actually is increased at all heights. And um, of course, it's uh, the, the veer is, is higher at the lower heights, uh, but that difference is always there. And uh, the wind veer actually is not considered in the design standard. And this is demonstrating uh, by real hurricane simulations and uh, by the idealized hurricane simulations from previous study that veer is existing, uh, especially for strong hurricanes that uh, the design standard should probably consider. So um, 
changing gears because uh, that was mostly uh, uniform mesh and I climbed a pretty course. The reason and the purpose was demonstrating it's the model is working. And uh, so after that, we start uh, testing the impact of different spatial resolution and how that uh, um, affect the results because this was uh, one of the, the highlights of a modeling tools because you can do the seamlessly transition from coarse resolution far uh, offshore and, and very high resolution near shore. And you can see there is an example. Uh, this is how the, the refinable mesh look like. Um, it's uh, so for this one it's used triangle mesh it's a uh, uh, it, it's a little bit different from other uh, modeling for example MPAS ocean or E3SM uh, they use um, uh, different um, shapes of those mesh um, so you can see that so here we are comparing the different spatial resolution of ocean only and see how different it is and the left column is the three kilometer refined mesh and the right is the nine kilometer refined mesh. And uh, you can see that uh, in that red line, it uh, starts slightly increasing the intensity. Uh, by the way, this is another hurricane. It's uh, Hurricane Henry in 2021. And I'll show you uh, why we look at this hurricane. This hurricane is by looking at the wind speed, you can see it's a weaker hurricane. It's a hurricane category one. But we we look at that because we want to take advantage of the observation data available uh, for this hurricane because it's relatively um, less severe and the drop sound and uh, the, the radar and all those actually can uh, get a pretty good picture uh, near the the hurricane center that we can use to validate our model. Um, and here actually is a, a vertical profile of the, the drop sound uh, using uh, drop sound um, as a uh, reference. Um, the, the black one is the drop sound. And you can see that uh, for our simulation result at the night kilometer, um, it's it's very different at the lower level and at the higher level when you do the nine kilometer for the ocean domain. And this was different. And when we actually simulate this nine kilometer using cost, it was it was not bad. It actually looks pretty reasonable and closer to the drop sound. But for our modeling tools, until we refine the mesh to, to three kilometer, uh, we see some very close results. Uh, that we are able to uh, capture, uh, especially near the low level. Um, there are still uh, some differences, for example, for other wind speed, uh, for other variables and all those. Um, and we are also trying to understand how this, this uh, surface wave coupling actually uh, and ocean coupling, right, uh, can impact such a high height uh, for those regions. Um, and and at this point, the atmosphere component is still still nine kilometer, and and we simulations would still rely on those cumulus parameterization, which has a very big impact based on our findings. Um. So um so that's the vertical profiles, and as I mentioned in the beginning, we also tested the um the domain size impact. Um again. Uh, when you do regional modeling studies, you need to uh, have a domain that is having reasonable results, but then uh, do not cost too much computing resource. And in this case, you can see that um, because we did find when we shift the model domain a little bit, you will see uh, a big difference in the model results, right? Uh, this model effect, actually, uh, the domain effect actually can be reduced, can be relieved if you use nudging, nudging technique, right? Many people are using nudging technique, try to push the, um, the model solution uh, towards the forcing data. In this case, we do not want to use nudging 
uh, although we did test it, it, it has a big impact uh, because um, when you use nudging, uh, the, the strength of that nudging uh, can be stronger than any other impact that you're studying. Can be the ocean impact, can be the wave impact, right? So without using that, we allow the model actually develop its, its own personalities freely, right? So in that case, you can see that when you have a different atmosphere domain, uh, which uh, shows uh, left versus right, uh, you can see the results is, is, is pretty different. However, when you uh, develop your ocean domain at different size, uh, the results are quite similar. You can see that, right? So that tell us, okay, the we do need to decide a domain that is um, well, covers the hurricane uh, life cycle traje trajectory. Um, ideally, you want to cover as much as possible to the uh, genesis uh, areas, right? Uh, but for the ocean domain, we find that um, it's uh, the size of ocean domain is not that critical, not that impactful for the, for the results. But we still, um, let me see, I'm not sure I have, but we still have a domain that is large enough, cover both land and ocean and all the way to the, the east side that are uh, almost close to the, the, the Africa. So we uh, make sure that we can co uh, cover the, the initialization of, or the, the hurricane genesis um, uh, of, um right so so that's um that's the both the ocean and and uh, uh the atmosphere domain that's on the east side uh for the south side um the we want to make sure that we cover the entire gulf of mexico domain uh although we uh have different priorities for the hurricane simulations for this project given the timeline uh, and but eventually Gulf of Mexico, the hurricanes over there is a, a big concern uh, in terms of the the, the risks uh, for for wind farms. So we want to allow uh, the capability over there as well. And then naturally actually covers both uh, southeast and northeast coast of US. And um, so here, I'm start showing the um, results of the uh, uh, high resolution of atmosphere modeling. Um, the uh, so in for this one, we start simulating the atmosphere at three kilometer um, uh, resolution, and um, and the ocean is uh, refined to three kilometer. Right, so we have three kilometers for both um, components. And we did find a very significant improvement uh, when we go to the high resolution. And um, in this case, we uh, you would avoid to use any cumulus parameterizations. Uh, and, and at this resolution, you would also able to uh, resolve the ocean eddies. So this is a pretty good resolution at the weather scale or mass scale. Of course, you can, uh, something we are also testing is we can go down to one kilometer and uh, uh, do the uh, vortex following domain. In that case, you only do high resolution where the the hurricane, hurricane is developing. Um, but there uh, would need some uh, more development for the coupling because the coupling involves this mesh exchange and, and regrading and all those. Uh, so the uniform atmosphere domain uh, plus the refined mesh for the ocean is something we're uh, using right now. And uh, you can see that, uh, so, okay, uh, showing one time slices as example uh, to show how the uh, hurricane structure is improved um, uh, when we use this fully coupled at the high resolution. And you can see that uh, here is the uh, 10 meter wind speeds 
uh, for uh, the hurricane center, which is the zero by zero line. Uh, those centers are physically can be over different locations, but we we use their own centers as the reference. And you can see that not until you couple everything together, you see this relatively symmetric uh, structures of, of the hurricane development with very high wind speed and in, in running atmosphere only is not able to capture that at the at the, the right location. Um, there is also this uh, example at the same time, uh, but this is a uh, vertical layer at one kilometer based on some radar data. And um, uh, you can see that the, again, the uh, fully coupled actually can give you uh, much better results than the uh, other experiment compared with the observations. And when we look at this cross section from A and B, uh, by looking at the whole vertical levels, uh, this is what you see. Uh, basically, in the observations, you see this is the, the eye, uh, very low wind speed all the way from uh, near surface, 500 meters, I think, all the way to the high. Um, but then you also see uh, high wind speed uh, around the eye wall, and you especially see the higher wind speed on, on the right side of the hurricane. And this is well captured in the fully coupled models. And um, I think this is the last slides I want to show here. Uh, I'd like to leave some, some time for questions and discussions. Uh, so this is the vertical wind speed. Um, again, at the storm center level, uh, but also the cross section for the uh, whole uh, vertical uh, profiles. And you can see that the fully coupled model can capture this um, uh, swirls uh, relatively better than other experiments. And if you look at the vertical profiles, again, you see those updraft and downdraft captured uh, in the simulations. Um, and I think there is a, oh, right. Um, and we also look at the uh, PDFs or probability density function of the wind speed of uh, all heights measured by that 3D reader, uh, but be between uh, 400 by 400 kilometers uh, uh, near the storm center. And you can see that this uh, green line, which is the fully coupled uh, uh, model, captures the closest distribution compared with the observation and also compare with others. And the vertical uh, velocity was also doing a better job than others, although it's still very far from the, the observations. Let me see. Yeah, I think uh, Su and Jacob, I think based on the time we have, I, I'll stop here and open for questions and discussions. Hey, thank you, Jali. Um, you know, very nice seminar, and we will open for questions. Um, please uh, raise your hand for your questions and then unmute um, to ask your question. Or if you prefer to type your question in the chat, I'll be glad to read it. Maybe I could start. Um, so if you do your interactions with the wind turbine manufacturers and uh, people like that, uh, what, what is the most, uh, what, what are they most interested in if you want to prioritize their interest? Is it, is it the extreme wind? Is it a shear or what is it? What are they most interested in basically? Mm -hmm. So um, thanks for your question, Jacob. Um, so several highlights that we want to uh, present in this whole project, right, across all the tasks. Um, the wind properties, including the extreme wind, wind gust, uh, shear and veer, but um, also the wave impact and the wind wave interactions or 
uh, misalignment or or whatever uh, the interactions there, which uh, we know it's important, but it's not properly considered as a joint um, features in the engineering modeling and, and design standard. So uh, although so far the uh, evaluations that we have done here are atmosphere focused, but wave impact is something that uh, we will put a lot more effort in the next uh, stage. And we closely work with the engineering modeling uh, with the other project. And um, we want to consider those impact actually and, and see how this actually eventually affect the risk assessment and, and or pose any additional risks that we didn't know before. Uh, after considering all those realistic uh, components in this uh, modeling. Okay, thank you, Xiaoli. Any other questions for Xiaoli? Okay, I think we're um, ready to end this particular session. And I thank all the audience, in addition to Jali, for uh, being here today. Um, as Jakob mentioned at the beginning, we're taking a hiatus over the summer, but we will begin these webinars again in September. And we already have a few really interesting webinars um, planned. And if you are interested in presenting one next year, please let us know. We'd love to integrate more of you. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jacob. Happy Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>